Our lovely co-host here, Rose, could be against the rules of some insurance policies just by being a member of my family. If you have homeowners or renters insurance or work in the insurance industry, you'll want to watch this episode. Welcome everyone to Saving America's Pets. I'm Holly Sizemore, Chief Mission Officer for Best Friends Animal Society, and this is Rose, my fabulous co-host. Does your homeowners, renters, or commercial insurance have breed restrictions for dogs in it? Did you even know that some insurance companies will restrict coverage because of the look or breed of the dog in your family? Today, we are going to get some information and advice from two experts who want you and your family to stay safe and protected. Lady Van Cavage, the senior legislative attorney for Best Friends, returns along with Ngozi and Naji from AKO Insurance Consulting to inform us of how our insurance may or may not be protecting us. Welcome, Ngozi. Welcome, Lady. So nice to have you both here. Thank you. Great to be here. Ngozi, tell us what insurances are affected by breed restrictions? Great question, because I think that's a great place to start when we start talking about breed restrictions and the impact, like what coverages are impacted. So I would say primarily when we're talking about personal lines and not to get too geeky, I'm a nerd, you know, around insurance, but um, personal lines is definitely one place where breed restrictions has have impact. And that is particularly related to homeowners insurance. So if you own a home, oftentimes your your mortgage lender is going to require for you know you to insure it, protect it, but then also renters insurance. One thing that hasn't really been brought up, you know, as it relates to breed restrictions, is the impact on potential commercial insurance. We're seeing a lot more of our business owners allow dogs on premises, right? Whether it's be, you know to be employee friendly or you know customer friendly. Um, and so we will see, I would assume in the future as more of that occurs and more um, businesses are open to the idea of having dogs in their facilities or on premise, that it will impact potentially commercial lines insurance. So for businesses. That's interesting. Lady, now you have done a lot with working with companies who don't have breed restrictions like State Farm. How do you feel like they came to the place where they embraced this breed neutral way of doing business? You know, State Farm, USAA, they, they don't have restrictions and we, we like them because of that. But again, I think they understand that 69 million households own pets in the United States. That's a lot. That's a lot of consumers. And, you know, and our relationship with dogs have changed, as you can see with, you know, your dog. I mean, basically, they're members of the family. So, you know, so 95% of Americans view pets as members of the family. And, you know, the, the research has shown that 52% of people got a dog after they got their homeowner's insurance policy, and they didn't tell their homeowners. And again, I wouldn't think to tell my homeowners. If I got a trampoline, I would. If I got a swimming pool, I would. But adopting a dog, I wouldn't think that I need to call my insurance company. You know, so again, people just view them as members of the family. And and I think that's why so many more insurance companies are reconsidering what they are doing because of the, the evolving relationship, in addition to, to other concerns. And Gozi, what is the ultimate concern with these underwriting and pricing practices that do have breed restrictions? So I think it's it's all about the claims, right? It's all about what is being paid out um, as far as damages um, related to the potential um, for incidents or claims to happen related to the dogs being in the home, whether it's it's bites or, or whatnot. Um, and I think that, you know, it's an area where we don't have a lot of good data. Right. And so I think that becomes kind of some of the concern around using the data we do have, which Lydia and I call and in in, in some others call kind of dirty data. Right. You want credible data to drive your underwriting practices and to drive the pricing of the risk that you're insuring. And so you need to make sure that that data is credible. And so I think, you know, the concern is the claims. Right. You know, insurance companies exist to make money. Let's be real. Right. <laughs> yes. Their primary business is to protect the families and the businesses that they serve, but they have to make a, they're looking to make a profit around that. And so when your claims experience or payouts or damages exceed what you bring in in premium, 
then you're not making money. And so for them, it's just a matter of here we have a premium for homeowners. Here we have a premium for renter's insurance. And if there's a dog in the mix, right, there is a concern that the liability associated with that risk could exceed what their consumers are paying in premium. So I think ultimately that's that's one of the concerns or the primary concern around um, breed restrictions is to eliminate that risk and ensure some profitability um, as they insure families and businesses with, with dogs. And and if I can jump in, I do think that now, you know, the DNA testing was shown that visual ID doesn't have anything to do with, you know, really the breed of dog. And the newest studies show that basically, you know, breed and behavior don't match, you know, all dogs are individuals. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's causing a lot of, you know, um, insurance companies to at least re-examine what their policy is and find out that it it is a lot of their policies are based on unreliable data. So that's clear that we can see how it negatively impacts, you know, the dogs. But let's talk about the people side of this. And Gozi, why should families, particularly black and brown families, be concerned about breed restrictions when it comes to insurance? Great question, Holly, because I think, you know, when to, to Lee's point, you know, when we when we adopt a dog or bring a dog into the home, we don't think initially around the impact on insurance. And so that becomes the concern, right? If these breed restrictions exist, the the probability um, of potentially not being insured, right, through your homeowner's increased premium. So the affordability and the accessibility of coverage becomes an issue with families with dogs. And what we do also know is that there is this perception, this bias that's um, inherent in our community. It goes back, it predates, you know, uh, current times, it predates, you know, civil rights, it predates slavery, where there is this negative connotation between dogs and brown, black and brown families. And so what we find is that with through breed restrictions, we see this bias coming through where we almost term, and I know it's a strong reference, but we really believe that it's kind of leading down this direction of redlining, preventing black, black and brown families from being in the neighborhoods that they want to be in, right? Because of these breed restrictions around insurance. But again, it, it also goes into breed restrictions and zoning, breed restrictions and housing, right? So that is our concern, particularly as it relates to black and brown families and being a, a, a black insurance agent, right? Those are the families that I serve. Um, 80% of my book of business is working with black business owners and black families. And so I get concerned when I'm not able to place coverage for them um, and not able to put them in and, you know, allow, give them the opportunity to be in the homes that they want to be in because they can't get the insurance or they can't afford the insurance because of these breed restrictions. So that's, that's the concern I, you know, I think families should consider when, when, um, you know, purchasing insurance and and they have dogs in, in the household. So how do you combat this? And what can other agents do, particularly black and brown insurance agents, uh, do to address these problems? So I think there's a couple of things that we as agents can do, um, particularly as it relates from the insurance side. And then I'll let Leedy talk about kind of what the consumer can do as well in their various jurisdictions. Um, so as a, I'm an independent agent. And so as an independent agent, I have access to a variety of different insurance companies, which is different from a captive agent. A captive agent only represents one insurance company. So for instance, State Farm is a captive agent, again, versus me being an independent agent, I can represent travelers, I can represent, um, you know, I don't know, selective, you know, there's a laundry list of carriers. So I think one, it's about educating yourself as a dog owner and as a homeowner or an apartment renter. Because if you're not educated, right, you don't know the right questions to ask and you don't know, and we'll, I, I'm sure we might talk about this later, about the legislation that's going on in your particular state. So educate yourself. But if you don't have that, that insight, that's where your agent comes into play. So don't be afraid to ask questions because what we want to be able to do is provide you with coverage, provide you with adequate premium around that coverage to protect you and your dogs within the household. So we're able to, as independent agents, look at more a variety of different carriers versus only being um, kind of confined to one. Now, those that are with State Farm, as we've indicated, do not currently have, uh, State Farm doesn't currently have breed restrictions. So that's great. 
But if you're not with State Farm and you're with a captive agent, just identify if you're in that situation, an independent agent that can help you, assist you, market. And when we use the term market, we mean go to different insurance companies on your behalf and look for a carrier that has it doesn't have breed restrictions or doesn't use breed as an underwriting um, mechanism or pricing mechanism. And so, and, you know, it probably, you know, I would also kind of put out there for any agents that are out there <laughs> that, you know, we have to do our homework too, right? Like we have to be educated about what, especially when we're dealing with more of our personal lines focus within our agencies. I'm going to give some advice to my cohorts here in the industry, insurance agents. Um, we have to be educated too, right? We have to know the legislation and laws that are applicable in our states or the states that we are licensed in that impact our consumers. So it behooves us to read the bulletins that come from the Department of Insurance, right? Um, you know, be aware, you know, even if it's a matter of kind of doing Google searches every week, right? Sometimes I do that because, you know, it's hard to keep up on emails, right? When you're receiving emails from clients and insurance companies and all over the place, but we have to do our homework because it does does help um, protect our clients um, and it prevents errors and omissions, prevents us from being liable for situations that go, go wrong. So my advice to my fellow insurance agents. How does someone go about finding an independent agent and specifically one that will meet their needs? <laughs> Another great question. Um, you know, it, finding an independent agent can be a little tricky, right? I mean, obviously you can do a Google search, you can ask Surrey, right? That's the, that that's an option, but sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between an independent agent and a captive agent. So when you're looking and you're identifying and whether you use Google or you're asking a friend, ask about the insurance companies that they represent. So if the response is, well, they only represent one insurance company, again, like a state farm, then you know they're a captive agent. But if there ability, there's an ability to list a number of different insurance companies, then you know you're dealing with an independent agent. So I would say, you know, again, I, I think independent agents are great. Let me say that before I respond to the second half. <laughs> um, but it, again, part of being, a, a, I think, a, a, a good independent agent is asking questions. The more you know about your client and you know, and the more you know about what they're trying to achieve and what they're trying to protect and the potential liabilities and risk associated, um, then the better you can, the more equipped you are to help them, right? So if I have a family that's coming to me, it behooves me to ask, well, do you have a dog, right? Because again, if I know that on the onset, then I can work with them to find coverage that helps protect them um, when they need that protection. So I think it's, it's you know, one, being educated around industry stuff, but two, being educated about your client and your cons the consumers that you work with um, to, to, again, provide what I say, the most comprehensive coverage for the most competitive price. Don't steal that. That's my line. But <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's good. Trademarked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Lady, what can consumers do? So as a consumer, you can um, call your legislator and ask them to sponsor a bill to stop insurance companies from um, discriminating against people with certain breeds of dogs, because there's no point. It's, it's based on unreliable data. You can also basically, as a consumer, change your insurance company um, to one that doesn't discriminate. Uh, but you have a lot of power as a consumer. And if you do that, um, you need to tell your insurance agent why you're doing it so they can go back to the company and say, look, I just lost a client because of this ridiculous policy if, if they're a captive agent and can't you know, shop around for you. If Gozi, is there anything else that you would like to say? The only other thing I'd like to say is I, you know, I think that as a society, as an industry, um, legislators, you know, we should all be working together to create um, an environment where we are putting policies and procedures in place um, that makes sense, right? And so it's it's this type of of policy and procedure that you know doesn't really make sense. And so we need to be able to have conversations, all kind of come together and realize that at the end of the day, we have to do what's best for the consumer, right? We we need to do what's best for the consumer. Um, understanding we you know insurance companies need to make money and there's profitability and we have agents involved, right? And the whole nine. But at the end of the day, it's about the consumer. And so how can we do right by the consumer um, in an effective and 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 um, uh, 
great way, I guess. So. Great. Thank you. Leedy? Ask the dog owning consumers to be active, you know, and check out and see if your insurance company does have restrictions. And if they do, ask them why. Housing is the number one reason why dogs are relinquished and, and insurance is a part of it. So we need to, to, you know, basically make the insurance company companies realize that the focus should be on the behavior, not the breed, just like they do with people. Well, and I don't know if this would apply to everybody, but when I uh, dropped my insurance agent for their breed practices, I actually saved money when I went to another <laughs> agent. So, hey, there's that. That's a right? plus, a plus and a plus. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, thank you both so much. Really appreciate you being here today. And thank you for taking time out. Thank you, thank Holly. You, Holly. Thanks, Ngozi. Take care. Thanks, lady. You have so much power as a consumer when it comes to your insurance protecting your family. Ask your provider about potential breed restrictions and let them know that you care and support all breeds of dogs because as consumers, together, we can save them all.